A reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry that God did not carry out the evil he threatened against Nineveh. He prayed, I beseech you, Lord, is it not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled at first to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, rich in clemency, slow to punish. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord asked, Have you reason to be angry? Jonah then left the city for a place to the east of it, where he built himself a tent and waited under it in the shade to see what will happen to the city. And when the Lord God provided a gourd plant that grew up over Jonah's head, giving shed that relieved him of any discomfort, Jonah was very happy over the plant. But the next morning at dawn, God sent the worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun arose, God sent a burning east wind, and the sun beat upon Jonah's head till he became faint. Then Jonah asked for death, saying, I will be better off death than alive. But God said to Jonah, Have you reason to be angry over the plant? I have reason to be angry, Jonah answered, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned over the plant which cost you no labor and which you did not raise. It came up one night, and in one other it perished. And should I not be concerned over Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot distinguish their right hand from their left, not to mention many cattle? Verbum domini. Lord, you are merciful and gracious. gracious. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for to you I call all day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiven, abounding in kindness to all who call upon you. Hearken, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the Son my pleading. All the nations you had made shall come and worship you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place, 
And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we for ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us and do not subject us to the final test. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Father Dennis Wilde. I'm an Augustinian priest from the province of St. Thomas of Villanova. And I also am Associate Director of Priests for Life, and it's a distinct pleasure to come back as often as I can. It's not too often, but when I do, I really enjoy being here, and I have the opportunity to preach the Word of God, especially in a place that defines itself as the eternal Word. That is a wonderful opportunity. On a visit to Jerusalem some years back, I vividly remember in the still of the finally quiet evening, I was making my way through the Via Dolorosa in the central part of Jerusalem, the old city. The shops were closed and barred and the streets were bare except for a few children darting around here and there. At one moment, the voice of a child pierced the quiet night. Abba, Abba, he cried. I didn't find out what he wanted, but I had no question to whom he was crying out, his daddy. There in Jerusalem, some hundred yards away, in that central part, then <coughs> apart from the city, now within its medieval walls, another man called out the same, Abba, forgive them, they know not what they do. That was 2,000 years earlier. However different the circumstances were between the words of a God-man dying on the cross, whose flesh was ripped apart, broken for us, and the playful cry of this little Jewish tot in modern Jerusalem, there was a bond nonetheless which is brought together in relief in the opening words of the most perfect prayer that we say every day, in fact, often every day, our Father who art in heaven. Lord, teach us how to pray, his disciples asked. Thank God they did though it is almost impossible to conceive that Jesus himself would not have shown them request or not. What Jesus revealed there in that moment of prayer instruction was no less than the pouring out of himself, crying, Abba, Father. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that Jesus wanted to give us a word that would inspire confidence and trust in our hearts for him and for his Father. The angelic doctor teaches God granted other creatures little gifts. To us men and women, he has given his entire patrimony, his father. He can bring up heaven and earth in the same prayer, and we can do this also as we pray, because we have a stake in heaven through Jesus pointing the way to the Father. St. Paul tells us we did not receive the spirit of slavery, but of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit of sonship bearing witness with our spirit that we are made children of God. Romans chapter 8. The ancient church historian of Roman times, Tertullian, reminds us that the expression, Our Father, was never given to Moses or any other Jewish leader or prophet. For Moses, it was, I am who am. Aloof, but then not too aloof either. God would make his presence with the Israelites and lead them forth, but from a distance. Even today, it is foreign to, in Islam to call Allah Father. That relationship is off the mark. Only when there is a son, the eternal word of the Father, can there be revealed a father. Not God as God, but God as Father. This was radical, and then not my father, but our father. Only Jesus could have revealed him as our father. This magnanimous mystery is called divine filiation, 
that is, our sonship and our daughtership in reference to God, a whole new ball game with new rules. Yes, we are made in the image and likeness of God, that is, from Genesis, paralleling his heart and his mind in us in some tiny way. But our Father says more. We are joined together not only by what we have in common as generated, given by God, above animals and other creatures. Now we can dare to say that God relationship is as father to son or father to daughter. Abba, Daddy, the trust of a child running to the security zone of his father's strong arms and hands. But also the love of an adult savoring and revering the love of her father experienced through thick and thin for her. In this relationship we share, not just as creatures, but even as creators, though not from nothing as the word properly implies, which refers only to God, but we are co-creators always with the Father expressing the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus Christ. In marriage, the sexual act that defines it imparts a never to be repeated new creation, words that we use in baptism itself. Biologically and spiritually not quite the same as any other human being, no two persons are ever 100% the same, and yet each of us is uniquely human. Such as we recognize in the spirit that directs labor to a proper good end, we also reference to God who brings us into new life. Under a father who draws all together for common good and protection of life and goods, the best of fruit is the human fruit of a child. The hour and father together create the seminal idea of everything that follows. Acknowledgement first of all that begins with and returns to him as father, hallowed be thy name. But then thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Marvelously join us as part of earth and heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer of the first Christmas, the angels sang above the shepherds in that field at Bethlehem. Gloria in excelsis Deo et in terra pax minibus bone voluntatis. Glory to God in the highest and on earth too, to those who do his will. Heaven and earth are joined at Christmas and in the Our Father. But there is more. If we can dare to call him Father, as we say in the liturgy, we can then dare to ask him to give us food. Yes, we are dependent on him, and we acknowledge that and ask for our daily bread. For Catholics, that daily bread is something even more. The tiniest crumb of consecrated bread, the host, contains the savior of the world, the Lord of life and the Lord of the universe, contained right in that tiny morsel. Animate and inanimate beings Human and angelic, he is Lord of all. In each and every way, and every one of us, we have his stamp, never to be repeated the same way stamp on each of us. From this bread, our sustenance and our Eucharist comes that which joins us as humans, spirit and matter, soul and body. It follows that we relate to one another in a similar way, in a way that others than Jonah did in our first reading, he was pouting, getting angry over God's justice and mercy. You know, look at that story. A tree rises and falls. It's a strange story, but we see God's magnanimity. We see God as being very active, and we see Jonah sitting around doing nothing. He didn't even want to go to Nineveh. And then when he goes there, he pouts over the fact that they were forgiven, that they themselves saw something better in life, and they repented. And Jonah didn't see the world that way. He was very much into himself, so much so that he couldn't even see the mercy in the hands of God working through those others. Anyway, we know that Nineveh was spared and Jonah himself was spared from drowning because that other story where he was in the belly of the fish or the whale, as we say, and then was spewed up on the land. So he was three days in the fish, as was Nineveh three days, it took three days to get through that. So here we see him as centered on himself. Now when we ask to give us our daily bread, it is not about my daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread, as we say, not my father, but 
our Father. Already the Lord wants to join us together. We are children of God now, St. Paul tells us. What we shall be come has not yet come to light. It follows then that we forgive those who sin against us. Well, not just that, but the measuring stick for God's forgiveness to us is based on our forgiving others. Now that's a pretty hard bargain. We had better know what we're in for and asking for in this easy to repeat perfect prayer. It's a pretty dangerous thing to call upon our Heavenly Father to measure us in terms of how we forgive others. Jonah wouldn't get the prize for that, I don't think. If anyone says he loves God and hates his brother, he is a liar, we're told in another place. What about those who say that they love God and allow the killing of the preborn human children in the womb to go on unabated? What about those who vote to continue it under the banner of choice? Yet for those who have been duped by such a choice that kills one out of three children who never see the light of day, even they, like Nineveh, can repent and turn to God. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as we forgive those who sin against us. Those post-abortive moms and dads who in beautiful ways are coming forth now and become the wounded healers for others. Rachel's Vineyards Retreat, Silent No More Awareness Campaign where people come out and, and address this issue because we can't keep it silent anymore because we need to forgive also and to recognize those people who have come from the sin of abortion can be forgiven and are forgiven when they hold up their heart to the Lord for repentance. So for those who come to grips with their past abortion, there is fertile area for God's forgiveness. But for even those that we must be disposed not to slot those post-abortive people, moms and dads, into a place. You know, our society does that. We don't get angry, we just get even. We hear that so often. People who are in prison and they finally do their term and they're released, they can't get a job. Is that fair? We can argue that, I guess, but we must never take the condemning idea in mind when we're looking at that particular assessment of person. Jonah did not have the maturity to let people grow and change, but he wanted his own comfort. Today, a comfort-seeking society often forgets the needs of others to be touched by <coughs> sacrifice and mercy. God is always doing that, and in some way the same sacrifice and mercy reminiscent of the love of Christ on Calvary must touch and spur us to act for others who are less fortunate, the sick, the poor, the bereaving, the tiniest humans in the womb, and the elderly who are on the verge in society of being abandoned or given a quality of life verdict by a hospital committee to end life. To forgive us as we forgive others also implies protecting us, Lord, as we protect others. We are our brother's keeper, though Jonah didn't seem to get that. Perhaps eventually he did. To an overwhelming extent, Sister Faustina, on the other hand, was a victim's soul, one who bears upon oneself in a special call from God the iniquities of us all, as Christ did. She reflected that in her life. Listen to the words of the saint we commemorate today. You know, it's not too well known that in as many conversations that she had with the Lord, and it's in her diary, but it's not too well known that she did have this experience, the tragic experience of souls who uh, of, uh, had abortions in their past. On September 16, 1937, she writes, I wanted very much to make a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament today, but God's will was otherwise. At eight o'clock, I was seized with such violent pains that I had to go to bed at once. I was convulsed with pain for three hours, that is, until 11 o'clock at night. No medicine had any effect on me, and whatever I swallowed, I threw up. At times, the pains caused me to lose consciousness. Jesus had me realize that in this way, I took part in his agony in the garden, and that he himself allowed these sufferings in order to offer reparation to God for the souls murdered in the womb of wicked mothers. I have gone through these sufferings three times now. They always start at eight o'clock in the evening and last until 11. No medicine can lessen these offerings. 
When 11 o'clock comes, they cease by themselves, and I fall asleep at that moment. The following day, I feel very weak. St. Faustina's diary is not her own. She was God's instrument to express his thoughts to the world. This diary is a diary of mercy, not judgment. And so even here, when we recognize somebody who has sinned very grievously in the past, it is not for that purpose, but to point that out so a person can come to grips, come to light, and turn to the Lord. There are many men and women who have been involved in abortions in the past. They are mothers and fathers, all of them, who very much wish they had not done that. Jesus gave the Divine Mercy Chaplet as a means to seek his mercy for all souls. And so the prayer that we offer in the Our Father has far-reaching dimensions, both personal and collective, in justice and mercy. And it reminds us far more than asking for our own sustenance, which we must. It gathers us together as children because we can say like never before, Our Father, Our Father, Abba, deliver us from evil. May we follow your will, not ours be done. That was our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the moment which spurred him on to the supreme sacrifice of Calvary, which for all times made the difference. He saved us. Everything else plays out from that sacrificial event. We too need to free us from the shackles of selfish greed and hardness of heart, which detours and destroys the way of love and life. What the Divine Mercy Chaplet through the writings of St. Faustina instill is the same as our Father. Jesus, I trust in you. Father, I trust in you. You are the way to the Father, Jesus. You are the truth guiding us in all ways of thought. You are the life that gives eternal life, raising us up on the last day to show us with pride and love the Father, our Father for eternity. God bless you.